Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Don and uh, Koyas. I'm from the Mohican Nation. Our tribe is was run by a clan system, so I was born for the Turtle Clan on my mother's side. And um, my Indian name is Tantanka Wambli. That name was given to me by the elders when I was given the responsibility to keep this uh, sacred hoop of a hundred eagle feathers. It was something that was the prophecies for almost 400 years. And um, when I initially was given that responsibility, I didn't want it. But then I, uh, I found out the, the elders felt I was ready. And so uh, I have been the keeper of that hoop of a hundred eagle feathers. Last August 10th, I celebrated my 32nd year of continuous sobriety. Um, <laughs> so you're kind of looking at a miracle, for those of you who might understand what I just said. Um, I almost died from uh, alcohol. I have eight children. I have six girls and uh, two boys. And out of that, there are 17 grandbabies. Uh, so far, and uh, two of my daughters have not started yet, but they have that look in their eye. <laughs> uh, I think they're going to pretty soon. And um, so that uh, leads me into saying, um, I, I was taught by my, my grandpa that when wherever you go somewhere, is that when that land belonged originally to the Aboriginal people, and I have to respect this place that I'm going and that I'm a guest on your land. And I know that your ancestors, you know, are, are here. And um, so it's with their permission, you know, as a guest, I come here to share what was given to me by a group of elders. And I think as we go through this, you will recognize that these are teachings. There's not something I invented. It's not something necessarily you can find on Google, um, which is a great source of information. But this uh, information come from past, being passed down generation to generation for many, many years. And uh, I still have to pinch myself to create it allows me to do what I'm doing. I just, uh, you know, I, I stand back there and I hear them talk and it's like they're talking about somebody else. I'm looking around to see who this person is, you know. Um, but there's been many blessings that I have received on this recovery path. And um, so I, I accept them and I accept the responsibility that comes with that. But um, I, I don't consider what I do to be work. An uh, elder told me one time, he said, every human being is born for a purpose. No one is not born for a purpose. And along with that purpose, you will be given all the talents and the gifts to fulfill that purpose. And if you are lucky enough to find your purpose, your meaning to life, he said, you will never have to work again. And so uh, that's the way it is, too. This isn't like work. It isn't like I have to go, to, you know, to... Alberta, it's like I, I want the plane to go faster, you know, to get up there to meet all of you and to meet my relatives, you know, with the First Nations people and that. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really blessed, is how I look at it. So I'm really honored um, to bring this message that was given to me to, to um, the sacred land and to the inhabitants you know, of this land up here. Our organization. White Bison was formed in 1988. We are guided ever since our beginning by a council of elders. We have a board of directors. We are a nonprofit, but the ones that we all listen to is this group of elders. And uh, what they helped us to see is that healing is possible. I remember the very first community we worked with 27 years ago now, they had about 4,000 tribal members who lived in two settlements. There was an assessment done. 
uh, it was said that 85% of the community above the age of 12 uh, had serious problems with alcohol. So you can imagine what the weekends must have been like. They had just one youth graduating from high school. 25% of the babies being born were FASD babies, fetal alcohol syndrome. It primarily comes from a mom who drinks while she's pregnant. And if you are not aware of FASD, if you don't know about that, they're both physically, mentally impaired for the rest of their life. There's no cure for it. The only cure we know now is don't drink when you're pregnant. You will not have an FASD baby. You don't drink, you will not produce one. And uh, of course, when they, they start to look like they have attention problems and they're diagnosed and they're often picked on in school and tend to drop out of school, they're heavily influenced by other people. I think many of our relatives in prison are FAS behavioral, you know, connected in that way. But you could imagine 25% of the babies being born, that's what their future was looking like. The average lifespan in this community was 37.6 years, which says a lot of death of young people, suicides, car accidents, those types of things were going on in this community. Sexual abuse was going on in this community. We worked with this community every month for four years. We went up and did the work, the community development work. Eventually we found out that over 80% of the women have been sexually abused in that community. I mean, think about that. Line up 10 women and eight of them were sexually abused. That's tragic. And in some communities that hasn't changed, it's still there. It's like the secret. It should be a crisis instead of normal. Also in this community, there was elderly abuse. The elders were afraid to come out of their houses at nighttime because of the drugs and the meth and those things that were going on in the nighttime. They were afraid to come out. One youth graduated from high school uh, in this community. There were five bootleggers. Everybody knew who they were. You didn't have to have a, somebody come in and go undercover. Hell, everybody knew who the bootleggers were. They are right there, you know. But they were tolerated um, to live there. So in my mind, that's how you would describe a community that is in a downward spiral. Very complicated, had been that way for a long time and continually getting worse. So we went and we worked with this community for one year. And at the end of the year, I knew it wasn't changing. We had a grant and the evaluations were just, they were awesome. But I knew that I was just playing a game. And I was at a point in my recovery where I started to consider that to be dishonest. I was reporting something that wasn't true. And so I decided to quit. But by then I had a mentor. His name was Johnny Looking Club. And he was the one I went to, my elder. And so I went and told him what was going on, what I was going to do. And he said, before you quit, he said, would you gather together 40 elders from throughout the land, the old people, the old traditional people, and bring them together. And he said, talk to them. He said, I think that they can help you. And so we did that in a very rustic gathering place in the mountains of Colorado. We located these 40 elders and we bought them there. And they changed our lives. They changed everything that we knew about healing and about recovery. So I described this community to them and um, my feeling was you could not turn a community with those types of problems for that many years, you could not turn it around. That's what I thought. And they said, no. They said, it can be turned around. So they went on to say, they said, there are two states of mind that you can be in as a human being. One they call the state of, I don't know what I don't know. 
Now, if you think about that just a little while, like if you don't know what you don't know, then you're doing what you do know, you could be doing things and it, not, it will never work because it's the wrong thing, but you think it's right. So they said, we're going to give you some information that will help you move from I don't know what I don't know to now I know what I don't know. And that's like when somebody t tells you something, you go, duh. You know, so the information we're looking for, it does exist somewhere, except that we don't see it, so you've got to do with your current information. So they said, we're going to tell you some other things. But they said, where did you look when you started doing this community development? And I said, Google. Everybody looks on Google, you know. And they said, what you are looking for is not in Google. They said, that's why it's not working. You was looking the wrong place. They said, if you want to know how it is you heal this community, they said, go back to the community. The community knows. Go back to the elders. Because those elders say they're 70 or 80. Then you say, what did your mom and dad tell you? What did your grandpa and grandma tell you? What did their grandpa and grandmas tell them? You can go back in time, a couple hundred years, way before Google. And there was a time, we know, in our communities that we did not have the problems that we have today. This is very, very new. It wasn't like this. Actually, not really that long ago. It wasn't really like that. So we went to those... We took the advice and we started asking these elders about how was it a long time ago. And so it was through that effort we started to develop some programs and we found as we develop these, each community has to use their own teachings. So we don't bring them teachings from the outside. We tell them you have to use your own teachings because the earth right here, it taught the people that originally lived here it taught them all the teachings, what it is they need to know. And so, this is how far back we were able to go. This was even before the coming of the Europeans, the light skins, long, long, long time ago. So a long time ago, where we got the information that we needed to know, we got it from the earth. So as we started to live in communities, they started to observe. They fought, they fought at first. They had tension and problems. And pretty soon they started watching the eagles and how they treated their young. And they started watching the trees and the air. And they started to recognize there's an intelligence system that's running everything here. There's something here. I cannot see it. But there's something going on here. And they became very aware of seasons and cycles and timing and it was so powerful that in many of the communities, what they called those entities was my relatives. They referred to the plants as relatives because the relatives gave them medicine when they got sick. So they knew there was a, a, something was in there. And they became very, very respectful of it. So pretty soon the worldview is everything was interconnected and everything was related and that majority of the things that we used was actually in the spiritual world. The majority of what we looked at was in the spiritual world. So in many of our languages, we can talk about that world. There's no, there's no English word because English didn't develop the word for something. They don't know what they don't know, I guess. And so it's very important that when we do this work, you go to those elders and ask them about the language if you don't know it. What is this word called? What does this mean? And they'll s struggle sometimes to tell you what it is, but that's the thing you're looking for. You see, hang with it. So these laws were so dependable. They knew their physical world, the spiritual world, and they knew these worlds were interconnected with each other. So they referred to them as natural laws. They call it natural order. There was a language that they used to describe this. So this is the way our communities looked during those days. We had culture, language, ceremonies, timing, seasons, interconnectedness. 
And we developed a system where we took the little boys and we knew about the cycle of life. We knew about what ceremonies, what season, what time of the year. And we taught those little boys how to become men. We knew how to do that. We were masters at raising children. And so we also, we taught the little girls. We said, this is what you need to know to become a woman. And the grandmas and the women and the uncles, they would teach them how to do that. And of course, the women, they then were taught to become elders. And the men, they were taught how to become elders. Then the elders started to play a significant role. Because by then their experience, like our elder was saying, their database got so big about this knowledge, there was no Google during those days, but the elders were our Google. So we would go to these elders and ask them to make sure we were doing things right. Grandma, is this right? When's the right time? So we got this guidance from my elder system, and this is the way that our communities functioned. Then those elders' job was to be available to us, to have this knowledge to share, and to make it available to everybody. During these days, very few of you would have jobs. We didn't need mental health workers. We didn't need youth prevention workers. The culture was prevention. We didn't need those types of... We didn't have domestic violence. We didn't have sexual abuse. During this time, actually, we didn't even have a hell. Uh, there was a time that our communities, we didn't know about hell. Then later on, some visitors come here and they said, oh, there's more things you need to know. You guys don't know about hell. And we had lived with what we had pretty good now. Ever since we learned about hell, we've been in hell ever since. And we're, <coughs> we're trying to figure out to see how to, get, how to not go there. But there are many things they told us about hell was against our culture. As soon as you did something wrong, shame on you. Bad girl. Bad boy. It was a whole new language. We didn't have words like that. That's not how we looked at everything. We always looked at correction. You made a mistake, look at correction. You made a mistake. Look. That was how we uh, functioned normally. So, this was how our community was. Isn't that kind of cool? How that was. We had problems. But we knew how to solve and resolve conflict. We knew how to handle that. We knew nothing was perfect. We had traditional disciplines. And we had different ways, you see, of doing things. So, this was the source of our native culture. When we say culture, this is what we're meaning. It was a very deeply understood by our people how this whole thing worked and how we fit into those beings. We were not better or worse than some of the other animals. We considered we were all equal. We all had a right to be here. So then, something happened to us. Something happened. I can speak specifically in the United States. The something that happened was funded by the United States government. It was funded by Congress. It was supported by presidents. And it was a strategy to take us from this to this. Now we all have jobs. Some of you got to work with alcoholism, FAS, child prevention, psychology, stress disorders. There's all kinds of things have happened to us. And instead of us having at the base of the culture, we somehow ended up with a layer of anger, guilt, shame, and fear in this forest. There's something that happened to us that was funded. It's intentionally, not accidentally, intentionally set out to destroy our nations, to destroy our communities, destroy our families, and destroy the individuals. It was a strategy funded to do so. Its purpose was to destroy the family structure, because that was our strength, was the family structure, the heartbeat of the community, is the family. Uh, so how was this done? This something that happened, this thing that they funded, how did they do it? 
They knew if they took away the spirituality, that was the key. We knew about the powers of the spiritual world. That's what we knew. We get lost. We had ceremonies. Had us go into the spiritual world to get that knowledge and bring that power back out. We knew how to enter that world and bring these things back out to us. That was, we had people very, very powerful knowledge that could do those types of ceremonies. They could see things way beyond what Western medicine and those type of approaches. They were very, very powerful. So they knew if they took away the spirituality, they'd knock us out of harmony with the principal laws and values. So everything tipped. And when we went out of harmony, then we've been mixed up ever since. There's something that happened. It was to make this work this way. But we kind of didn't know, you see, what was going on. Two years ago, we made a, whoops, two years ago, we made a journey across the United States based on the instructions from our elders. We made a 7,000 mile journey. In 50 days, we covered 25 boarding schools. At these boarding schools, we gathered the stories from these elders of what happened to you when you were little, when you were right in this school. We went right to the school and videotaped those. We videotaped 183 hours of the video. It took us a year to get that down to six hours. The six hours, it took us another six months to get it down to a one-hour video. The video will be released in about three weeks, but I want to show you a very, very short trailer of what I think is very important for people who are in this business of healing to know. You got to know where you came from. You got to know what happened to have an understanding because what happened then is directly connected to the issues and problems that we have today. So we'd like to uh, take a look at this video. This Horace Axel is a Nespers elder in his 80s. He's the head of the seven drums. He's our elder of our elders. So we dedicated this. A long time ago, before you were born, the old people told a story about a visit from the wisdom keepers. The wisdom keepers told us the light skins are coming and their numbers would be great. They will bring great destruction and confusion. That we will go through a time of testing. They will bring four mind changers to make us forget our ways. The mind changers would be a liquid, a black book, a song and a card. They will take your land. They will poison the earth. They will bring disease and sickness. They will kill the women and the children. They will destroy our culture. Only our spirituality will be left. After the testing time, a great healing will take place. The eagles will come back. The buffalo will come back. We will come back. The prophecies will come true. We are now in the time of the fulfillment of prophecy. The story that happened has never been told. Now is the time to tell the story. Genocide Tactics as defined by the United Nations. Number one, killing members of the group. An example of that would be the Wounded Knee Massacre. Number two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. A good example of that would be the 1862 Mass Hanging. Number three, Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, in whole or in part. A good example of that would be the longest walk made by the Navajo Nation or the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Number three, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. The United States government sponsored sterilization of Native American women. Number four, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. In 1879, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the first of 500 boarding schools. In 
It happened here in the United States of America. Some of the genocide tactics included massacres, forced relocations, sterilizations of women, boarding schools. California alone paid $12 million on Indian bounties. After the atrocities, only about 1% of the native population remained, making this perhaps the largest genocide of the 20th century. Genocide was sanctioned under 24 U.S. presidents from 1830 to 1933. Manifest Destiny a term that was coined in 1839 and revised in 1845 to sanction the colonization of North America. It was used to designate the belief that the United States was destined, even divinely ordained, to expand across the North American continent. Thousands were murdered and relocated in the name of Manifest Destiny. By 1920, 99% of all Native Americans were wiped out. In 1879, the U.S. government implemented the genocide tactic of removing the children from their native culture and placing them in one of the 500 new boarding schools. This was an attempt to eradicate the Native American culture and assimilate those children into European culture. In 2008, a gathering took place in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The purpose of this gathering was to talk about intergenerational trauma. The pain and hurt at this conference was so intense that the elders instructed us to make a 7,000-mile journey across the United States. We traveled to current and former boarding schools to gather these stories from the people who attended when they were children. We recorded the stories of what happened to them. Here are their stories. The stories that we heard on this journey from these elders were so unbelievable. Some of the elders, they even had a very difficult time even talking about what went on there. Many of the elders who told the stories of what happened to them was the first time that they ever told a story to anybody, even their children, their spouses. No one had known the experiences that they had in these boarding schools as children. Could some of you feel that? Your heart get heavy? Some of you get a lump in your throat? That's how intergenerational trauma does to your microphone. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but that's that thing that we carry around. That's that thing that will have you cry at sunset. It will make you want to run. It will make you want to move. It will make you want to not commit. There's all sorts of things. It makes you feel weird. It makes you feel shameful. Sometimes when we talk about uh, our culture, when we talk about something that we consider to be true, very often the science world will call it a myth. They don't believe it true because it's not scientifically protected. So we can spend years trying to prove something. So another thing the elders, they tell us is this. They call it the ancestors within. Our grandma and grandpas. I have my parents. You can see I kind of look like them. I have my grandparents, their grandparents, all the way back. If there was a hurt a rape, an abuse, beatings, if that happened to those that eventually made me, I am carrying that hurt around even now. That even when I see something similar, all of a sudden I start crying. I wasn't there, but I'm carrying that around. And so we don't consider that to be a myth. We know this is true. How do we know? Because those old people told us it was true. Because how did those elders know? Well, where did they get it from? You see, they're elders. So we're now able to start to make this make some sense and it's something that we call historical trauma. Something that's handed down one generation to the next 
then very often those younger generations, they don't even know what was handed down. So you'll see a lot of our youth are just angry, but nobody knows why are they angry. You see shame, and no one knows why do you have that feeling. We don't know for sure. But we're starting to understand that because we got our own native researchers to research this along with the teachings and we got starting to get a better understanding that this historical trauma is an immense losses and traumatic event perpetrated upon an entire culture. So its job was funded to take away culture, take away the language. I was doing a training in Minneapolis a couple of years ago, I believe it was now. And we had this circle going and it was this young girl she was telling this story. She was in her early 20s or something like that. But anyway, she was raised by her grandma because her parents were alcoholics. So grandma was, had raised her. And she said she was five or six or so. And anyway, she come home from school and she grandma was cooking and she ran in the kitchen. Grandma, grandma, I learned a new word. And grandma said, oh, what did you learn? And she spoke a word of Ojibwe. Her grandma was from that community. And she said she was so excited because she learned this Indian word. And her grandma turned around, grabbed her by the shoulders, and she said, she just shook me. And she just slapped me right across the face. And she said, don't you ever speak that word in here again. Never, never, never. Just a little girl, so she was just shocked by it, you know. So the, as the feather went around the talking circle, grandma happened to be there. An elder She's one of these elders that has wrinkles on her wrinkles. You know those, they're just like, you go, you go i got to take your picture. You've got to be on the calendar. That's how beautiful they are. And so she got this uh, talking feather and she, you could tell she, something was going on because it got dead quiet. You know, everything is interconnected and it goes, Choo! and so uh, she said, I, I, I'm going to tell now. She said, I, I was never going to tell nobody, but i got to tell she said, when I was a little girl, she said, this one morning the Indian agent came by, they had the wagons, there were other kids in there, and told my parents it's time. So they took the brothers and sisters and they put them in this wagon, took them down to the boarding school. And she said the only language that she could speak was just that one that she learned. That was the only way she knew how to communicate. And she said a couple of days later she was talking to one of her friends and a teacher came over and got her and she took her in the other room and set her down at this table, and she said, uh, this man came in there, and he, no one said anything. He just grabbed my hand, and he put it on the table, and he pulled out a butcher knife, and he chopped my little finger off. And she said, I didn't know why he did that. I didn't, he just did it. And she said, they bandaged it up, and she said, that night, she said, I just wanted my mom. I want to go home. But she couldn't. So a couple of days later, she was speaking, just talking, a normal conversation with her friend. And she said, when the teacher came for me, I knew what was going to happen. She said, I fought. And she dragged me into that other room. And sure enough, that man come in there, pulled out a butcher knife, and chopped my second finger off. And now Grandma's just really crying, you see. And she looked across the circle at her granddaughter, and she says, Granddaughter, she said, I never told, but that's how come I only have two fingers left on my hand. She said, when they did the third one, I knew, I got it, don't speak your language. And she said, I never taught nobody. And when I heard you say that word, she said, a feeling, a fear come up inside of me and I, I was so scared I wanted to protect you. She said, I always felt bad because I hit you. But she said, it just happened automatically. It's like I was saving your life. You, you think that's a true story I told you? You think that happened? It did. In some of the schools, that was the strategy that they went through. I have a story of a grandma in Arizona. She had five fingers missing. That was a, could you imagine that little girl, how she grew up 
who, who, her, her, the, the trauma and the loss and those things that happened, and she kept that a secret, never told nobody, to the extent that she would do that to her granddaughter that she loved. Well, that was the type of strategies that were used here to take away the land, the people, to take away a way of life, and to destroy the family structure. And it did. So how that was done is through these boarding schools down there, all of these children here, the first school at Carlisle, they took the children of all the leaders, all the chiefs, all the leaders, they took the children, that was the first class. Because if I have your children, you're going to do what I say. It was kind of a military strategy in a way. Now this is how it worked. Remember, we had a system in place to teach the children. So what they did is they broke the cycle. They created these schools and forcibly, in many cases, took the children away through many different means to one of these 500 boarding schools. And at these boarding schools, the kids, they didn't, they didn't teach them to heal. They were not taught the spirituality. It was taken away. All the various things that we would have taught them, it was taken away. And in its place, the process of taking it away was the beatings, taking away the language, the punishment system, no teachings, soap in the mouth, various strategies that they used. Now you've got to understand, these little kids are going to come home. Eventually they're going to get out of school and they're going to come home. So as they grow up, you can imagine them growing up, the high school, and then they come back home eventually. And this is where we started to see the appearance of alcoholism in the communities. This is where we started to see the first appearances of the violence. Now, if you are raised as a child in a violent way, now you're going to get married, whatever, and you're going to have children. So do you see how that violence is passed down to that little child? The next little child is going to be raised in that way in what they were raised, you see, in the boarding school. This is called this intergenerational trauma. And so... Unfortunately, what happened was, as they grew up, became adults, but when they became older, it's like the one that told you, anyone can grow old, not everybody can be an elder. So when they came home, they didn't know the language. They didn't know the ceremonies. They didn't know the songs. So it destroyed our elder system as we knew it. See how the effectiveness of that strategy as far as destroying and so we end up today, we have elders and we have old people. And there's a difference. Age does not make the elder. It's what those elders learn as they were growing up. And so it, what we are doing is finding ways to rebuild this structure back, you see, to how it was. So we ended up now, we have jobs. Some of you are working in violence, domestic violence jobs, sexual abuse. We're working in all these areas. This is what we're passing down generation to generation. And the later generations sometimes don't even know it's being passed down. It's just something that is. That's the way it is. We're passing this down. So this is a cycle that we're trying to break. But it's not only that. You take that alcoholic tree. It's going to do some things that's going to have losses and grief and shame and guilt. But that person also is carrying around inside of themselves that hurt of those ones before them. It may not mean something to somebody, but we just did a group. And you know what? One of the things that was very, very big trauma-wise was the loss of language. Nobody says it out loud. But for a long time, because I couldn't speak my language, I was ashamed when somebody would say, could you speak your language? Can you pray? There was something missing inside of myself that didn't... Because Grandpa, he would only speak it when we were alone. If anybody was around, he got really upset because he was taught. So we were sneaky. You see how to do things. Loss of culture, loss of ceremonies. Many of the younger generations. So when we heal, a part of this healing, we've got to figure out how do you go inside to get that hurt from your ancestors so they can be free? How can you heal them so that they can be free? And this is how it appears in our community, something called intergenerational trauma. Now, the thing about trauma, the way that it works, is it lays dormant. It doesn't surface right away. Like if you've got a secret, 
you keep it inside, it just lays dormant. So at a community level, it lays dormant, sometimes for two or three generations, and then eventually it will surface. Do you think this trauma is connected to today's suicides? I mean, I mean, think about what you just nodded your head to. Because if it's connected to today's suicides, would it be of advantage for you to understand and know about the trauma that that person is carrying around and know how to process it? Do you think it's connected to diabetes? Is it connected to health problems? Relationship problems? Alcoholism? Drug abuse? Meth? Is it a reason we go from one addiction to another? See, alcohol is not the problem. It's a symptom of something else. Stopping drinking don't cure your life. Or the meth. Or there's other things that we do. We just... Now it's prescription drugs. There will be something after prescription drugs unless we get to the root cause. You see, of why... What is really going on in our communities. So... This trauma is very significant for us to realize we've got to heal from this before we'll stop and break that, those cycles for that because it's playing itself out in many different forms of which many of us are working in the communities these days. The suicide, drug abuse, internal oppression, all those things is connected, you see, to the trauma. Now, the system is still there. We're talking about the kids. The system didn't change. The little kids are taught by that, are taught by that, are taught by that. So do you think these little trees, you think they're watching the big trees? That's how they're learning. That's how we're growing up. Uh, and unfortunately, the way the system works now, we have many of our young people are going to prison. I'm talking about teenagers, teenage native kids. I, I went to a prison where they had uh, 100 native Boys, of which the youngest one was 11 years old, was in prison. There's something really wrong if you've got an 11-year-old kid in prison. Something's really, really wrong. And they got girls, Indian girls in prison. In prison. Indian kids incarcerated in prison. And unfortunately, we got them going to treatment. Some of you will have jobs there. We got them in the court system. Some of you work there. You can get degrees in this stuff now. Master's degrees. In, and unfortunately, too many of our kids are going to heaven. Suicides, car accidents. They're not supposed to go there. So I want to uh, just wrap this part up. Uh, we'll look at a very short video and then we're going to start looking at solutions. Um, this is a very, very short video clip. Get it? What we're talking about here? The world in which our children live. Our children did not create that world that they live in. We adults created that world for them. And then when it goes, doesn't go right, we turn around and we blame them. And we write grants. They're high-risk youth. 
I think someday the day is going to come when we adults got to get those kids together and we have to ask them for, for forgiveness for what we've done to them. We have to make an apology for what we have done. Because that's the way that it works. That's how the Creator designed the baby to, to learn. They just watch. And whatever they see, they don't necessarily do what we say. They become just like us. I remember when I got into recovery, I had made a vow very, very young. One thing I will never do is be like my dad. <laughs> and I, did, I said, I don't care how it's going to come out. I will not be like him. And guess what? When I did some inventory work, jeez, I was just like him. I couldn't hardly stand it. I had a hard time even telling anybody that this was true. But it just turned out, you see, in that way. And so, we need to know that we can change these systems. These systems can be changed. You see, we knew a lot about the cycle of life during the old days. We knew the teachings, what to teach them. This is what we knew. Is We knew in the cycle of life that you would grow in a four-year cycle, like spring, summer, fall, winter. And in that season, we were supposed to teach you something. And we did. We knew how to do it. Then, the next four years, by then you're eight. We knew what to teach them. We knew exactly what they needed to learn during that season. Now they're 12. And we knew exactly what to teach them. Then we knew the next cycle is going to be puberty. And so we do the ceremonies around puberty or passages or rites. We knew exactly what to do. All around the cycle of life, clear to an elder, we knew what it was was supposed to be taught. Not only did we know that, the Creator designed a human being to work in harmony with that. So, we now know that the cycle is broken because the teenagers, we know they're, they're doing the hurting and then you'll hear us analyze them they don't have an identity they don't know who they are so we analyze the the you know what's going on with them and we know they don't have an identity and one of the reasons for it is the universe in the first four years there's certain things you're supposed to learn even brain cells will disappear after a little while like times of learning language it's designed to learn multiple languages at the same time, then later on, disappears. So we knew what to teach them during those times. So the universe, the design of the body, it gets to that age and it says, teach me this. And we used to. But what happens is we don't teach them. So something goes out of harmony now. But the universe continues. The next cycle, it says, okay, teach them this. And what happens? We don't. We don't teach them that. And it continues. Teach them this. And we don't know those teachings no more. Or we know them and we're not doing it. And then it goes on and says, Ah, teach them this. And we're not teaching. Even the universe, the body is designed with stages of development that you're supposed to teach certain things to this sacred being as it grows up. And then what happens? Well, I don't know. They got identity issues. I don't know what's the matter with them. They're watching too much TV, MTV, and listening to it, and they're not respecting the elders, and they're not. So we tell all these things that's wrong with them. We grow them that way, in a sense. And it's hard to say that. So this is what we're passing down from generation to generation, the, the descendants of the boarding school. You see the impact of the boarding schools in a trauma that's being passed on? Okay. I have heard it said, more powerful than the march of a mighty army, more powerful than, that's powerful when armies march, but more powerful than that even is an idea whose time has come. This healing time that we're in is an idea whose time has come. The elders, they told us that nature has some laws. And one of them is balance. So if something goes out of balance, nature is designed to always be restoring balance in order, in harmony, even though it may not look like it. 
So they said, as a people, when those things that happened to us, we went out of harmony, went out of harmony, got worse, got worse, got worse, got worse. They said, the day is coming, the natural laws will say, that's enough. And we'll muster together forces to turn around and to start to bring it back into harmony how it was supposed to be. That's how the elders talk to us. And what they call that force is a healing time. They said, we're, we're entering in the healing time. Can you sense something's going on, not just among Native communities, but there's a hunger for spirituality. There's this thing where you get these, mo- so many are nodding your head. This is the thing I'm talking about. And that's why we're all needed. So I remember at this gathering, I was kind of skeptical when they started talking this way, and I'd say, like, how do you know it's a healing time? It sure don't look like it to me. CNN's not reporting it. I mean, like, how, how, how do you know this is? And they said, okay, we're going to tell you. This isn't on Google. What they said was, we are entering into a time, the universe. They said, what you were trying to do before, it's like you were trying to plant corn in winter. That stuff that you were doing, that's why it didn't work. But if you do that stuff that you were doing before, it's in spring, it will work now. We tried to work together before, we couldn't. Now we're in a time we can work together now. So that this healing time is here, and they said, this is how we'll tell you it's true, is we're going to tell you about the prophecies. This is stories that have been handed down in our communities for many, many years. So at this elders' gathering, what they said to us was a long time ago. The Creator came to Turtle Island and He gathered the people together and He said, I'm going to divide you into four directions. Red, yellow, black, and white. Into each of the directions, I'm going to give you a responsibility, what was called original teaching. So to the red direction, He said, you are going to be having them written in your DNA to know about the earth, the plants, the animals, the interconnectedness. You will even call this thing the Mother Earth. Everybody knows Mother Earth. Oh, that's red direction. The yellow direction, you got the air, the breath, the wind, the meditation. Because there's powers there. And so they were to learn those powers. The black got the water. The white got the fire. And they said they're to go through the cycles of time, gathering the experience of these teachings. And the day would come that all four directions have to come back together you set in a circle. Red, yellow, black, and white, finally, setting in a circle. Because each of us has teachings, the red direction cannot heal without the knowledge from the black, the yellow, the white. There's something, but you can't heal without us either. So we each have something that is known. And they said when you set in that circle what you'll start to realize, your first realization will be that the Creator did not make four races. The Creator only made one race. That's the human race. But we were in a delusion that there's four different races. That's not true. And they said, what you will realize is that's not true. And you will realize that when you are in the womb, it is there that the Creator gives you what they called your earth suit. So you come out of the room, your suit's red, yellow, black, white. Wouldn't it be really cool if you'd have a gathering like this, but they had a room you could go in there, you could unzip your earth suit before you come in here. You unzip it like that and peel off of that darn thing, you know, and you just come sit down here as a circle of human being. You wouldn't even have to be careful. Don't say the N word, don't, well, how many, don't say the blue word and the red word and this and don't say that. You just come here and just let it all hang out, man. Just be yourself. Just say what you wanted to say and not have caution. But isn't that the way it's supposed to be? And they said in this, what, and during this healing time, what you would start to realize is you look at somebody whose suit was different than yours and you'd be given the insight to look past the suit right inside and you would see that person differently. That you love your children like I love my children. You have a certain way of believing about the Creator and that's okay. And I have a certain way of believing about the Creator and that's all right. But as we bring those forces together, but he said it's going to take a healing time to do it. But even then I said, how do you know it's a healing time? I said, that sounds really cool, but how do you know? So this is what they told us. 
The first elder that spoke, he said, what the old people told us is that you will know the healing time is here when the eagle lands on the moon. So in that tribe, they're always watching the moon to watch the way eagle landing on there. Well, I happened to work for NASA from Apollo 6 to Apollo 13 when they shot the lunar module up where they landed on the moon. They had actually put eagle feathers on that lunar module. I knew that because I was there. And so that m module that left the Cape and it flew up in the air and it circled the moon. And when the, the lunar module come down on the earth, the first words ever spoken from the moon, the eagle has landed. Could you imagine grandpa and grandson sitting there watching, eating pizza, and you're watching this, that lunar module is firing, it's coming down, and it lands, and then it finally... You hear the announcement, the eagle has landed. I bet Grandpa would say, I told you so. You listened to me. I told you the eagle was going to land on there. And they said, shortly after, the healing time would begin. And another, another elder at this gathering, they told us, they said, this is what the old people told us. They said that a spider would build a web around the whole earth. It would go around, build a web, build a web, build a web, and he said, when it was done, a woman would come forward, she'd speak on that web, and all nations would hear her voice, which today we believe is the Internet. That there's that. We were waiting for certain things to happen, and what they told us was, the reason the woman spoke on the web and not the man is we're out of balance in male energy and female energy. And that the woman has to come forward and to restore the balance. You see, like this. I remember 1991, there's 572 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. Seven of those tribes at those time were led by women. The elders told us about the prophecy. One year later, it went to 53. A year later, 97. A year later, 140. And what we can tell in the work that we do, once a woman is elected as a tribal chair, it's about six months we get a call. Could you come help us with our families and our children? Most of the requests we get are actually... And I'm not talking about diversity. I'm, t I'm talking about the spiritual laws, the natural order. We need both male and female. We can tell us going to be in balance because we have gatherings like this. You'll see about half men and half women. Now you see about nine tenths are women, very, very few men. We men have to wake up. We got to get that warrior spirit going again. I think that day will come because we're not here, and I'll speak to, uh, just my own opinion, you know, from the native view is. Their day is going to come when we men, we're going to have to make an apology to our women for what we've done to you, for not being there, for leaving you with those babies, for not worrying about support. Days come, the men are talking about, we know we have to do this. It wasn't right. In addition to that, somehow the Creator says, well, we're not right there, women. You've got to come and help. Get in leadership put on your arrow shirts or whatever to take the heat, but it's got to come back in balance. And this is how they started to talk to us. They also said, what you're going to see is young people with old spirits, young kids, young ones. They're going to be like elders inside, the little people. Some of you have, you have born those ones. You might have three, four kids, but you got this one, it's, it's like they're elders. You got you almost can write down what they're saying. You go, where did they get that? Uh, not from me, obviously. But you just kind of know. They kind of know these things. There is one up in the Shoshone's at Fort Hall there. Eight-year-old girl, she sits in this talking circle we're doing community development. She was straightening those adults out. She would say, can I say something? Lay down her little doll. She'd stand up and she'd just tear him a new one. And they would get in a fight later on, you know, and they couldn't stop. They'd look over to see if she's going to say anything. And uh, they keep fighting, you know, till finally she'd stand up. And she'd say these incredible things, sometimes make you feel just ashamed. But she had that power. And she still does. Now she's a teenager, still doing the same thing. 
Another prophecy they said, when the sun gets blocked in the seventh moon, one week before this gathering, there was a major solar eclipse. So from that tribe, they said, see, it's time. The healing time is here. Awakening is going to occur. The energy is going to shift. Ever how the different ways say it, we sense something is going on, and that's also true in our native communities. You sense something is going on. We want to heal. We're sick and tired of being sick and tired. We are willing to cry now, go through what we got to go through so that our babies don't have to. Isn't this true? We don't want to let our grandchildren go through this. Let us do it now. We'll make the tears. We will cry. Do those things you see that we have to do. So what is the key for us to do this? as the spirituality was taken away, we went out of harmony, we know we got to come back to harmony. That the culture is prevention. The earth teachings is where we got to be. So it's by creating, bringing back the spirituality, creating that vision to lead our people back to that place. And how do we do that? It's returning to the culture and those teachings and the principal laws and the values. How we evolved in this whole process of prophecy, etc., was something called the Wellbriety Movement. As the Civil Rights Movement in the U.S. was to do with injustice, injustice, this Wellbriety Movement is for, uh, is our movement to heal from social, from social issues. The Wellbriety Movement, it has very little to do with alcohol and drugs. It's the coming together emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. Who should be in that circle? is mental health, obesity, diabetes. We should all be in this circle. That's what the Wellbriety Movement is. It's not just drugs and alcohol. It's about bringing together that whole person for us all to sit down because each of us has knowledge that will help. Mental health, do you think it can help a person with addiction? Do you think nutrition can help with the body? There's many of us have to work together in order, you see, to make this... uh, this healing, this holistic approach to healing to guide us back to to this process. So what is it we do? What's the approach? Well, the elders tell us everything has polarity. You've got honest, dishonest. You've got irresponsible, responsible. You have intergenerational trauma. Then what do you have to have on the other side? Intergenerational healing. So we're not talking about a 30-day program here. We're talking about a process of creating events of trial and error, of going to the elders, getting the teachings, learning them, passing it on, relearning a language. We have a tribe that we're working with, the elders teaching them one word a week. He posts it up on a big old piece of board. He writes that one word. In one year, they learn 52 words. Now they're learning phrases. Now the kids are finding out they can talk in front of the teachers and the teachers don't understand them and they really want to learn that language now (laughs) because they want to say, you know, whatever the kids say about teachers. So it's by bringing back the very thing you see was taken away. So how is that done? Initially at this gathering, the elders said, we'll start you out with four laws. Later on, we'll tell you more. 20 years later, we have 128 teachings, but they didn't start out that way. They said four laws. If something is to occur, changes to occur, it's going to change from within. Change does not come down to an org chart, to a council or a band or whatever. That's not how it happens. So if you, Gandhi said it best, Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see. You have to change you into that change that you want to see, no matter if they change or not. You want the community to change, it has to change within itself. The second law was in order for development to occur, it must be preceded by a vision. No vision, no development. And that's one of the natural laws. The human being is different than the rest of the species in that we have been given a will, a free will. So the visioning process does not apply to the salmon. They don't have to vision. Because they got the blueprint, they just got to kind of do their deal. We're different. We can choose to live in harmony and we can choose to live out of harmony. It's up to us. 
So we have to make some choices here. The second law is called the great learning law. This is baby, youth, adult, elder. It means everyone needs to be in the learning. What he really says is you can't just go work with youth programs and expect them to change. They won't change. You want the youth to be respectful, the adults and the elders have to be respectful. You want the youth to quit drinking, the adults and the elders have to quit. You cannot just work with one. It's a great learning must occur. And the last one is you must create a healing forest. This healing forest, it's about, it kind of works like this very quickly. Suppose you have a 100 acre forest, all different kind of trees, and that forest has a disease or a sickness. In other words, it's a sick forest. Then you go to that forest one day, you grab one of the sick trees, you uproot that tree, you take it down the road, you plant it in a nursery, right where it gets the good soils, the mineral, and the water, all those ingredients that will make that tree healthy. Or this could be you grab a young person out of the community and take them off to treatment. Kind of the same deal. So as that tree is sitting in that soil and it's getting greener and healthier and you can just tell it's getting back to how it was originally supposed to be, then maybe at home uh, or you're walking, you know, past that tree at night and you're last one at work, you know, because you don't be caught doing anything stupid. But as you walk past that tree and you're the only one there, you go over and you hug that tree, you know, and you pat it on the bark and whisper some good tree self-esteem statements or whatever. Green is good, you know, go, go, go. But then you get that tree to be healthy. Then you bring a healthy tree back into the sick forest. What will probably happen to that well tree? You take a kid, you put them off the treatment, you give them all the teachings and the cultures, you give them all that, then you bring them back home. What's going to happen probably to that young kid? Or you go off to school, or you go off as soon as you come back. So the elders, they said... There's other forces working here, and you have to create a force that's in healing, a healing forest. So then, they said there's some order to this. You can't just go around and do it. How the natural order, so this was the next teaching they gave us. They said, first the individual must heal, then the family, then the community, and then the nation. There's an order that you have to follow. So we had to create a way to to trigger personal healing. So what we were able to do is this, is uh, we went to the white direction to fire people and we found out that a program was working was called AA and they had 12 steps. And so we brought those 12 steps to our elders and what they told us is that those 12 steps were a natural order of healing. And what they told us is that we need to bring that information to our communities. So the ones that we train to do this, we call fire starters. And so they said the only thing we would change is put the steps in a circle. So we put three steps in the east, three in the south, three in the west, three in the north. And then we gave the teachings to it. In the east is finding your relationship with the Creator. For those of you who know what this is, defining yourself is inventory steps. In the west is making your amends, set yourself right with the relatives. And then in the north is the elders' teachings. And as we started to add the culture to this, all of a sudden they started to respond. We need one another. We need the knowledge from one another to put it together, you see, in order to make it work. So we were able to, we created a program for men first. And as they got rid of the anger, guilt, shame, and fear and started bringing back the culture, what the community started to say is, you know, they're getting kind of traditional, these guys. They're coming back. They started using the word warrior. The warriors are back. Then I remember we were so excited this. We had to call our council elders together. And uh, the clan mother says, well, where's the one for the women? And I said, well, just let them use this one. Bad, bad, <laughs> bad. So we become very aware that men and women are different. But those of us in relationship, don't, don't we know we're weird to one another? Like we don't understand one another sometimes? We heal different. We look at things different. So we had to make one, you see, for women in healing. When we did that, it started to take off. And how, how we do this is we use the grassroots. We train the grassroots how to take videotapes, DVDs, that has the teachings with workbooks, and have them conduct groups working one-on-one -on -one with people 
along with the professional communities as an available thing, but they form these circles of recovery and it starts to, it's one person working with another person, like this elder said, you start to share your story of what you did and the other person is either going to believe you or not. And if what you tell them is the truth, the odds are they say, I want to be like her. I, I, I want what you have. There's that process, you see, that starts to go on. And they call it peer-to-peer -peer coaching. And then we had to take on the issues of the family. So we're able now to go into communities and we can do seven trainings simultaneously. Who would ever think, who ever said you could do seven trainings in a community all at the same time? So we just tried it and all of a sudden it worked. So the last one we did, we had 125 people. All of those of you who want to work with men in recovery, room one. Women in recovery, room two. So we divide them off in an interconnected way of looking at a community and each of them have a series of coaches. You have coaches for daughters, coaches for sons, coaches for dads, coaches for moms. It's a systemic change approach. And we have some books written about that some of those are back there that you're going to get. But it's at this point where you'll start to see the old way come back. It doesn't happen in 90 days. You'll start to see the spirituality returning. Culture is coming back. You see more sweats or more ceremonies or more songs. The kids start learning to pick the medicines and understand how it uses and how do you build it and how do you... Because each of those are teachers. And we've seen that those things are starting to come back, you see, to the communities. And so, uh, it's about rebuilding this family structure. And it's about restoring clan systems on tribes that had clan systems. And that is kind of a counterbalance to the org chart. The clan does not think like an org chart. The clan thinks different than an org chart. And so we bring in those teachings on how to look at organization, things different. Then we also have a program uh, as we go, hit the wrong button, as we go through this uh, clan system, then we had to take a look at our relatives in prison because we saw a tremendous increase of Native women in prison. I mean, huge, big, and no programs for them. So we went to the elders again. We created a program called Warrior Down, uh, which you can look on our website and get some further information on it. But the Warrior Down program, the first one we did was in Boise, Idaho. Of the first 50 Native men who come to Warrior Down, went to that training. Two years later, 49 never drank. One slipped. The group got him back in recovery, and none of the 50 went back to prison. And what made it work? Two things. They came back to a circle of people who care. And they came back to the culture. Our culture, you see, when you study languages, our, our people were a loveful people. Our language is loveful. We did giveaways and potlatches. It's still... The, our, our language has love words. It's a loveful language. We were taught nature is a giveaway, right? The tree gives away the fruit that gives it away. That's how we learned to be a loveful, giving people. We gave away. That was the way we did it. And so the, this, this is about giving and caring and, and hoping and using, the culture is so powerful. One ounce of culture, just an ounce of culture, it will give you 10 pounds of healing. Do you think our culture is that powerful? Is love that powerful? You take the culture and I say, just lick it. Your life going to change. <laughs> Meaning, just pray at sunrise with your medicine. Just that. And your life will change immensely. That's what I mean. It's all gone. We can't. If you just take what you have, it's going to straighten your life out tremendously. But that knowledge you see is still there. It's not, it's not that it's not there. It is there. And so these Warrior Down programs, you can see that. This here represents consciousness. 
This is a community belief. That's where the whining takes place. We won't let us do nothing. We gotta get a new council. There ain't no budget. How come the money don't come from the government? It's going to be like this forever. Some of you that are involved in this healing stuff, you gotta look, you gotta walk in that forest and, uh, you have to walk in that forest and shake it up. You're gonna to have to say the unsayable in front of people who would want to hear what needs to be said. You gotta talk about making the impossible possible. You want to start to change the community self-talk. Yes, we gotta start talking different about ourselves. Some of our communities we work in, we're, we're like victims. Some of the communities we work in, it's like entitlement. You owe me, you owe me. If this thing is going to happen, we have to do this ourselves. We know what's broke. This is not a mystery, if we're honest. You, some people say there's an elephant in the living room or there's a buffalo in the teepee. Ever how you want to say it, you got to talk about that thing that's there. It's there. Somebody say, excuse me, counsel, there's a buffalo right in this teepee and everybody's pretending it's not there. There is sexual abuse. The violence to women is intolerable. We're not going to put that up with anymore. We're not going to stand for your not passing the right policies for that. You've you got to say things out loud. We're in a healing time, plus all those forces you see, they are there. So we have the power, you see, to make this change in our communities. We have the power through creating like grief recovery workshops is what we're working on now. Some of you will want to... That will be your song. That will be your purpose is to help heal from the grief, to bring these circles that we have right to the community and to attract the hurt and to attract that pain to these circles using the culture, using the training uh, for us to do it. Because what the elders tell us and what we're working on is in order for us to be free from this trauma, we have to forgive. Well, we tell them we're going to work on forgiving the United States government for what he did. It's going to be about forgiveness. And that isn't easy. We have ceremonies and things for, for forgiveness. And that's what our approach is, is to start to take a look at, in the old days, they had things they did around forgiveness. There were ceremonies for it, we're starting to find out. And that it's about bringing back the culture. Recognize, acknowledge, forgive, and change. Recognize the trauma, acknowledge that it did happen, which you are fortunate because your, your government admitted it. They said it. Not just a sorry, I watched, uh, I was up here when that was made. Our government won't do that yet, but we got pressure on President Obama. He can't turn around and there's not a letter coming in and it comes through Congress. We want that acknowledgement like how you guys got. Not that it's going to solve, but it will help. If somebody will just say, this did happen to you guys. This did happen. Then we can go on, you see, and do the healing part that we need to do. And to forgive uh, and to make the change. So this is some of the approaches that we, as you can see, it's not something I invented over a period of 20 years. I have been um, guided by a council of elders, and I try to listen and to interpret you know, the way uh, they tell me. And we build programs and those things designed around that. So uh, what we'd like to do is to take a, a break, kind of a short break, maybe 11 minutes. We will start in 11 minutes. So if you want to join, uh, feel free to. We got some very uh, exciting workshops showing, now that you know all of this, how do you actually go and create a native vision? How did the old people vision a long time ago? It's a lot different sometimes than you learn in strategic planning and those things. There was some other knowledge that we had to have, and when we come back from break, we'll get some instructions, break into some groups, and uh, have a lot of fun. So we'll talk to you all in a few minutes. Thank you. In that way. But you could imagine...
25% of the babies being born, that's what their future was looking like. The average lifespan in this community was 37.6 years, which says a lot of death of young people, suicides, car accidents, those types of things were going on in this community. Sexual abuse was going on in this community. We worked with this community every month for four years. We went up and did the work, the community development work. Eventually we found out that over 80% of the women have been sexually abused in that community. I mean, think about that. Line up 10 women and eight of them were sexually abused. That's tragic. And in some communities that hasn't changed, it's still there. It's like the secret. It should be a crisis instead of normal. Also in this community, there was elderly abuse. The elders were afraid to come out of their houses at nighttime because of the drugs and the meth and those things that were going on in the night time they were afraid to come out one youth graduated from high school uh, in this community there were five bootleggers everybody knew who they were you didn't have to have a somebody come in and go undercover hell everybody knew who the bootleggers were they're right there you know but they were tolerated um, to live there so in my mind that's how you describe a community that is in a downward spiral. Very complicated, had been that way for a long time and continually getting worse. So we went and we worked with this community for one year. And at the end of the year, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Don and uh, Koyas. I'm from the Mohican Nation. Our tribe is, was run by a clan system, so I was born for the Turtle Clan on my mother's side. And um, my Indian name is Tantanka Wambli. That name was given to me by the elders when I was given the responsibility to keep this uh, sacred hoop of a hundred eagle feathers. It was something that was the prophecies for almost 400 years. And um, when I initially was given that responsibility, I didn't want it. But then I, uh, I found out the, the elders felt I was ready. And so uh, I have been the keeper of that hoop of 100 eagle feathers. Last August 10th, I celebrated my 32nd year of continuous sobriety. Um, So you're kind of looking at a miracle for those of you who might understand what I just said. Um, I almost died from uh, alcohol. I have eight children. I have six girls and uh, two boys. And out of that, there are 17 grandbabies uh, so far. And uh, two of my daughters have not started yet, but they have that look in their eye. <laughs> I, I think they're going to pretty soon. And... Um, so that uh, leads me into saying, um, I, I was taught by my, my grandpa that when, wherever you go somewhere, is that when that land belonged originally to the Aboriginal people, then I have to respect this place that I'm going and that I'm a guest on your land. And I know that your ancestor land and to the inhabitants you know, of this land up here. Our organization, White Bison, was formed in 1988. We are guided ever since our beginning by a council of elders. We have a board of directors. We are a nonprofit. But the ones that we all listen to is this group of elders. And uh, what they helped us to see is that Healing is possible. I remember the very first community we worked with 27 years ago now. They had about 4,000 tribal members who lived in two settlements. There was an assessment done. 
uh, it was said that 85% of the community above the age of 12 uh, had serious problems with alcohol. So you can imagine what the weekends must have been like. They had just one youth graduating from high school. 25% of the babies being born were FASD babies, fetal alcohol syndrome. It primarily comes from a mom who drinks while she's pregnant. And if you are not aware of FASD, if you don't know about that, they're both physically, mentally impaired for the rest of their life. There's no cure for it. The only cure we know now is don't drink when you're pregnant. You will not have an FASD baby. You don't drink, you will not produce one. And uh, of course, when they, they start to look like they have attention problems and they're diagnosed and they're often picked on in school and tend to drop out of school. They're heavily influenced by other people. I think many of our relatives in prison are FAS, just behavioral, you know, connected. I knew it wasn't changing. We had a grant and the evaluations were just, they were awesome. But I knew that I was just playing a game. And I was at a point in my recovery where I started to consider that to be dishonest. I was reporting something that wasn't true. And so I decided to quit. But by then I had a mentor. His name was Johnny Looking Club. And he was the one I went to, my elder. And so I went and told him what was going on, what I was going to do. And he said, before you quit, he said, would you gather together 40 elders from throughout the land, the old people, the old traditional people, and bring them together. And he said, talk to them. He said, I think that they can help you. And so we did that in a very rustic gathering place in the mountains of Colorado. We located these 40 elders and we bought them there. And they changed our lives. They changed everything that we knew about healing and about recovery. So I described this community to them and uh, my feeling was you could not turn a community with those types of problems for that many years, you could not turn it around. That's what I thought. And they said, no. They said, it can be turned around. So they went on to say, they said, there are two states of mind that you can be in as a human being. One they call the state of, I don't know what I don't know. Now, if you think about that just a little while, like if you don't know what you don't know, then you're doing what you do know. You could be doing things and it, not, it will never work because it's the wrong thing, but you think it's right. So they said, we're going to give you some information that will help you move from I don't know what I don't know to now I know what I don't know. And that's like when somebody, is, you know, are, are here and... Um, so it's with their permission, you know, as I guess I come here to share what was given to me by a group of elders. And I think as we go through this, you will recognize that these are teachings. There's not something I invented. It's not something necessarily you can find on Google, um, which is a great source of information. But this uh, information come from Pass, being passed down generation to generation for many, many years. And uh, I still have to pinch myself to create it allows me to do what I'm doing. Uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I stand back there and I hear them talk and it's like they're talking about somebody else. I'm looking around to see who this person is, you know. Um, but there's been many blessings that I have received on this recovery path. And um, so... I, I accept them, and I accept the responsibility that comes with that, but um, I, I don't consider what I do to be work. An uh, elder told me one time, he said, every human being is born for a purpose. No one is not born for a purpose. And along with that purpose, you will be given all the talents and the gifts to fulfill that purpose. And if you are lucky enough to find your purpose, your meaning to life, he said, you'll never have to work again. And so uh, that's the way it is, too. This isn't like work. It isn't like I have to go, you know, to Alberta. It's like I 
I would want to plan to go faster, you know, to get up there to meet all of you and to meet my relatives, you know, with the First Nations people and that. So uh, I, I'm I'm really blessed. Is how I look at it. So I'm really honored um, to bring this message that was given to me to to um, the sacred.